Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's talk at CSDS. Uh, my name is Avdhendra Sharan. Uh, I'm a historian. And I'm very excited to welcome Eleanor Markusen to speak to us uh, today afternoon uh, in a sad context where lots of lives have been lost on account of an earthquake in Turkey and Syria, but also probably the most apt speaker to speak on the theme. Uh, she's the author of this wonderful book that I'm currently reading called Acts of Aid, uh, which looks at natural disasters, earthquake uh, specifically, but also state and nation building, and how something like an earthquake and the reconstruction that happens after that becomes an occasion to, to reshape society and politics. Uh, so I'm really looking forward uh, to a lecture today. Uh, I can also tell you as a historian, the book is a historian's delight. You keep looking for sources that she would have missed and you don't find any. So, you know, it's always a pleasure to find a book that's so well researched that uh, even some of us who think we know that area slightly better uh, can't find a source that's been omitted or missed. So thank you very much for this book. We, we look forward to, to reading the book, but we also look forward to your lecture today. Uh, very briefly, uh, Eleanor is a researcher in history at Linnaeus University in Sweden and member of the Center for Concurrences in Colonial and Postcolonial Studies. I'm not very certain what exactly that means, but I'll leave that to you. Uh, her research explores uh, environmental history, infrastructure, and historical disaster research. And as I said, she's the author of Acts of Aid, Politics of Relief and Reconstruction in the 1934 Bihar-Nepal earthquake that came out of Cambridge University Press last year. So welcome, Eleanor, and the floor is yours, about 45 minutes. Okay, and the title today for today's lecture is Disaster Relief and Its Politics. one more time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sharon, for this um, very kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today. And I'm grateful also for the timely invitation by CSDS um, and actually being able to be here with you in person today. Um, but it's, of course, wonderful to also have an audience online um, via Facebook and the recording to enjoy afterwards. I'm very much also looking forward to your comments and questions afterwards. And I know this is an extremely informed audience of uh, historians. Um, and I have not had many book talks. It came out very late in 2022. So um, this is also a part of the book, I should say, that I'm focusing on. So it, it, it's really, I'm excited to hear uh, your comments. Um, so my talk today, titled Disaster Relief and its Politics, is based on the core chapters of this book, um, Acts of Aid. Um, it's a monograph uh, based on uh, my PhD. Um, as you may notice for today, I have excluded uh, the reconstruction bit from the title of my talk today, mainly for reasons of time constraints and with the hope of focusing on the disaster relief. However, aid for the purpose of disaster relief is already aimed at victims of different kinds. And reconstruction in this case cannot be fully detached from relief. Um, so, yes, I will also briefly touch upon the re reconstruction part that I devote uh, quite some time to in the book. Right. Run away my slides, I'm not moving. <laughs> Sorry. Next, please. Uh, let me start with a brief, brief background to the book, which is based on my PhD, as I mentioned, in South Asian history from Heidelberg University. As a PhD candidate, I was part of an interdisciplinary research group on historical disasters, working with concepts primarily borrowed from sociology and in conversation with scholars from various strands of literature and art history. Before that, my undergraduate st studies were a mix of social sciences and humanities. Um, so I'm essentially an area studies person uh, with, with the degrees in Hindi and history of religions and anthropology, as well as a master of science in South Asian studies. In the historical disaster research group, uh, Teitelberg, we worked with questions addressing connections between perceptions, interpretations, and responses to disasters, 
how these change over time and differently so across regions. An underlying idea is that we, societies and individuals, integrate natural hazards into the social fabric on various levels differently, depending upon how we interpret and perceive them. So to some extent, the framework supports the idea that disasters can provide lessons to prevent future disasters. In this way, cultural history and social history could provide us with a greater understanding for the social change needed in the present era of the Anthropocene. In contemporary environmental terms, then, learning from historical disasters could translate into strategies for moving away from vulnerabilities towards these practices of adaptation and resilience that we keep hearing. So another way of framing, um, I think for some disasters in history here, would be to argue that the occurrence of disaster can play a role in social transformation. This was argued by scholars already in the 1920s and more recent literature, for instance, the much cited <clears throat> article by Mark Pelling and Kathleen Dill from 2010, Disaster as Tipping Point, argue that disasters can be viewed as junctures where social and political power can be either transformed or entrenched depending on context. So historical disaster studies aim to bring this further understanding to how socio-political and cultural contexts potentially are impacted by disasters, or they can also play on the reverse mode, how certain types of socio-political contexts affect how disasters are perceived, interpreted, and responded to. So here on the screen, we see uh, Greg Bankoff's uh, very influential book from 2002, Cultures of Disaster, Society and National Hazards in the Philippines, and the other one, Disasters in History, it's, uh, with, um, by Bas van Babel with colleagues, is a monograph um, from 2020. It really sums up the field of disaster studies, historical disaster studies, disasters in history. Um, and then we have two other examples from, from different regions then. Mark D. Anderson's Disaster Writing, the Cultural Politics of Catastrophe in Latin America from 2011, and Gregory Clancy's book from 2016 on the Meiji earthquakes in Japan. These are some, I would say, um, you know, very representative uh, global examples of, of the literature in historical disaster studies. If we then move to the South Asian context, to date, there have been few full length studies in the field of South Asian history on the subject of natural disasters in the sense of disasters originating from a natural hazard, such as an earthquake or a cyclone. Building upon Ar Arnold and Bankoff, um, we can see, for example, Upamanyu uh, Pablo Mukherjee, um, the book in the middle um, and on the lower line. Uh, he argues that disaster relief in the was a form of palliative imperialism, within quotes. It was the outcome of a fashioning of India as a disaster zone. He discusses the first of all. He discusses first of all Victorian disaster debates in fictional accounts and ad administrative documents from the 19th century, and he restricts his examples to famines and epidemics. Although he refers to them in the more general term, so-called natural disasters within the colonial framework, how, how as we know, famines were considered as uh, uh, the outcome of natural hazards. We would say today, we have, of course, also. Um, as you, um, especially the audience here in this room, have, are aware of Praveen Singh's book on, for example, colonizing, uh, not, not the book, his uh, PhD, Colonizing the Rivers, Colonial Technology, Irrigation and Flood Control in North Bihar. Um, I think also touches on the same as Rohan de Sousa, um, Drowned and Damned. And we have also, for example, Christopher V. Hill's book, um, on The River of Sorrow on the Koshi in Bihar, uh, which also you know, talks about this, the, the um, the social construction of nature to a great extent. So, but David Arnold's book from 1996, um, and also the, the latest one, I would say, The Imperial Disaster, um, also based on the PhD Kingsbury's book on the Bengal cyclone of 1876, um, are quite you know, representative of, of the field of historical disaster studies in, in, uh, in the South Asian context. Titanka Roy's uh, overview book, Natural Disasters in Indian History, I think gives a really broad, uh, great economic history view uh, to the field of uh, historical disaster studies. And, you know, Mike Davies, the political ecologist, has also made a great contribution in highlighting this, how, how famines were uh, part of colonial governance. Um, and you know it's also striking in terms of the covers, etc. How how they uh, connect to to the famines and 
not so much otherwise the disastrous aspect here on the covers. Um, let me dive into the, the actual case here, why we are here today in the book. So this was a, 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 just a brief background to what guided my research. Um, the 1930s was globally a period of many crises, such as the Great Depression, authoritarian regimes in Germany, Italy and Spain, a gradual increase in violence across Europe, as well as in the European colonies, topped in the end by another world war. So, but the decade was also defined by the political struggles for democratic rights in many parts of the world, and in particular so in South Asia. The 15th of January 1934 was a sunny winter's day with strong and piercing winds in northern Bihar. The bazaars were unusually busy with villagers who had descended on Darbanga, Mustafarpur, Mongir, and smaller towns for the impending festivals. Others had just finished lunch and were resting in the winter sunlight when the earthquake threw them off their charpais at 2.30 p.m. So the earthquake happened at 2.13 p.m. in the afternoon, which was, uh, we could consider very lucky um, that it was not in the nighttime. Approximately five minutes later, the built environment of entire towns lay in ruins. The earthquake that became known as the 1934 Bihar-Nepal earthquake was felt across northern India with the worst affected areas in Tirut in North Bihar, the town of Mungir, south of the Ganges, and of course, the whole of the Kathmandu Valley. Contemporary publications called it by different names, partially depending on the earthquake affected area covered and its impact, and partially framed according to the intended audience. We would have the great Indian earthquake in many of the colonial publications or the publications in England. We would have the Indian earthquake in the same type of publications. And we would of course have the Bihar earthquake in many of the South Asian publications or in Nepal, the great earthquake Mahabukampa. While official administrative and GSI publication describe the damages and overarching frameworks for the relief and reconstruction programs, the victims of the earthquake took center stage in publications by or in support of relief funds for them, which I will speak more about today. Many had died in the bazaars and survivors were displaced. The official government figure of 7,253 deaths was far less than the approximate number of 20,000 20, deaths stated by the Bihar Central Relief Committee, a civil society or organization started by prominent members of the Indian National Congress in order to collect funds for relief and coordinate the relief work. So moving away from the event for a second, um, my talk today focuses on the longer relief process in the aftermath. Um, when the earthquake struck, Bihar and India were already in a state of political crisis. Um, as I argue, narratives of the aftermath offered space for criticizing the colonial government in various ways, but it also offered a space and a time for existing ideas and alternative forms of governance. As we can see here, a scientific maps by the Geological Survey of India, the GS GSI, marked the highest felt intensity area, red, 10, the little kidney you can see here, and the surrounding areas of red stripes, the next level were nine. These gradings of the areas were based on felt reports obtained, obtained through questionnaires and interviews and on damages to the environment and built environment. The main four officers involved in this work acknowledged the difficulties in obtaining information, um, mainly it was from government officials and a few planters in the area. And only later part of the damaged area in Nepal was accessed. Therefore, the earthquake damages, as you can see here, abruptly cease on the other side of the borders in maps from 1934. Uh, in this map here, which, which is published in 1939 by the GSI, uh, they could also not include a much fuller account of Nepal because it was still not known. Uh, the worst affected area, 10 and 9, had been refined and so had the area outlined as eight. So you can, for example, see here that the banks of the Ganges from uh, Patna to Munge, for example, um, uh, have been marked um, in a different zone within a, within a different zone and so forth. So it's, uh, it's not always as we think like uh, one area that is the center and then it decreases. Here it uh, depends on the fluvial condition and the, the land um, affected the buildings and the, the impact of the earthquake very differently across the region. So 
why I'm focusing here on the responses, um, and by studying the responses after the earthquake, I seek to understand how this large and sudden disaster functioned and became part of a socio-political process at this specific historical moment. Well, I would argue here that I briefly raised before that this sudden, unexpected, and purely so-called natural disaster, such as the 1934 earthquake, can open these political spaces where, where power can be contested and concentrated in relief work and rehabilitation. To some extent, the idea of disaster as a magnifying glass, discussed very much so in li disaster literature, makes sense. Yet for historians, or at least for this one, for me, the socio-political process around extreme events, sorry, the next one, um, and what societies and people make out of them give us a better idea of the impact and role they can play. I would also like to highlight some continuity and breaks with practices in previous disasters and relief, um, foremost so in famines and, and flood relief. To what extent can we discern a continuity with previous responses to disasters and or where did breaks with established practices occur? The earthquake is not necessarily the disruptor here, rather it may, it may set in motion a socio-political process that merges with society. The aftermath of the earthquake in 1934 was for India's nationalist politics partly an accelerator, part, oh, sorry, back again, <laughs> partly a continuation of political relation through the disaster relief it engaged with. Um, questions that indirectly come to the fore in this process are how does the response to the earthquake fit in with the experiences of other disasters in this colonial experience that we have um, before that? In particular, the two last points, the politicalization um, of disaster relief and, the, and, the, and its potential to entrench or change uh, socio-political relation uh, is of interest here. So compared to the scientific maps by GSI and other published in the science journal Nature that we saw in the, one of the previous slides, the locally produced maps of the earthquake in the days and weeks following the event give a clearer view of how the broken infrastructure impacted communication in the area. An important buildup to the politics of relief that started almost directly in the aftermath was the disrupted communication for several weeks. Initially, the colonial government in Patna did not know of the severity of the damages in Musafapur and Darbanga until messages carried by runners directly from the area or telegraphed via Bagalpur arrived. Telegraph, rail and road communication, not the least bridges to the north were damaged or in ruins. It was also a one-way communication. <clears throat> As officers in the northern parts would recollect, they did not know if Patna still existed or if there was help to expect from the government or anyone. Information about the scope of the earthquake, its impact on North Bihar, did therefore not transpire until, quite surprisingly, Captain Bernard's air circus flew across the area and responded to the message chalked across the ground in Musafapur, earthquake take care. At the same time, the government in Patna had ordered two aeroplanes from Calcutta, but to its surprise, within hours of having sent the request, the private aeroplanes from Captain Bernard's air circus arrived with news from Asafarpur and Tirut at Patna 5 p.m. in the afternoon of the 16th of January. So it would take more than 24 hours to deliver the news, um, the full news, I would say. So <clears throat> as published widely, it was the first Indian earthquake to be documented from the air, as the photographs in flight showed. Here with the example of the town of Musafapur. The earthquake often became the Indian earthquake, as I mentioned before, often accompanied by these spectacular images of urban or infrastructural damages. It was framed as, I quote, a great disaster on par with the 1923 Cantor earthquake, a disaster which had generated enormous amounts of international relief, a point I will return to later. The impact on communication that the earthquake had was profound on the organization of relief. This is emphasized in the local government's narrative of the aftermath, destroyed infrastructure and administrative chaos impeded its ability to act swiftly. While under these circumstances, the colonial government focused on security rather than mobilizing personnel for rescue operations. They guarded the jails, they retrieved the prisoners, secure the um, administrative buildings and so forth and waited for, for rescue. As a result, the government's organization, preparedness and leadership appeared limited and inadequate. And this continued uh, not just in the first phase, but for weeks. Much of the disaster for the local government was in fact the loss of administrative capacities through information and communication. 
So in this space, we see here, as I mentioned before, of weakened governance, uh, Rajendra Prasad, later the first president of India, with support uh, from other leading in the Na Indian National Congress members, began the organization of relief operations from his hospital bed in Patna, under arrest actually, but he was released two days after the earthquake, resulting in the formation of the Bihar Central Relief Committee, its purpose being to collect fund and or funds and organize relief. The politics surrounding disaster relief emerged through these publications we see here, the cover of the Bihar uh, Central Relief Committee's public report, uh, by both relief organizations, uh, which I'll come back to, and the government. These were narratives that focused on disaster victims, but also the stories told by victims, the, one, the ones who survived, and the rescuers embodied, by the, uh, embodied in the relief organizations. These publications would come to create different narratives of victimization and the need for relief. Disaster relief very soon became a tool for nation building and a practice in state formation where the Congress proved its ability to take on governance, even under extreme circumstances. The criticism of the colonial government was not directed at incompetence and failure in disaster management, which it was indeed criticized for, but at the systemic failure of colonial governance overall of organizing its government. The disaster relief in the case of BCRC, the Bihar Central Relief Committee, was a way of putting political discourse of care for citizens into practice through the disaster relief. The idea that Prasad and several leading congressmen from the region in the 1930s suddenly then organized here so-called non-political relief work may seem hard to believe in view of the political work that had landed them in prison in the years leading up to the earthquake. Much of the challenges to current uh, governance in this period um, in the relief work took place as a form of parallel governance, i.e. it was a non-inference in the questions that were considered politicized, such as potential peasant agitations and um, a cautious view to distributing so-called middle-class relief to begin with. The BCRC was, however, not the first attempt by the INC to organize relief for people in distress. The Congress had extensive experience in setting up relief funds in various regions across the continent. However, nationwide appeals for relief um, in natural disaster did not appear until in the 1934 earthquake, and again in the 1935 Quetta earthquake, a little bit more than a year later. By the time the Quetta earthquake happened, the Bihar earthquake had already gained retrospective significance. The Congress used the success in Bihar in its open criticism of the government's relief operations and were subsequently also banned from participating in any relief work in Quetta. The context being very different, of course, from in, in Bihar. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the Congress, Relief collections covered a wide range of activities, as we know, in the 1920s to the 1940s. At the beginning of the 1920s, the Congress had founded several local committees and expanded its relief activities to also include relief, financial compensation to political sufferers. Um, most famously, perhaps, the Tilak Swaraj Fund, for example, was the most prominent and served several purposes for the Congress. Uh, it was perhaps no wonder then that the government's stance towards potential uh, Congress involvement in relief was cautious. Preceding the earthquake um, in the aftermath of a flood in Orissa in 1933, the government suspected that the situation would be used for Congress propaganda, and it instructed local administrators to stop Congress action in, uh, in disaster relief, even if it was not objectionable in any way. Nero, Jawaharlal Nehru, who until his arrest on 12th of February 1934, was an important person with regard to appeals for funds and someone who had been accredited with giving the first donations towards the BCRC. He disagreed with Prasad and others willing to cooperate with the government in disaster relief. <clears throat> he was, however, arrested based on political content in three speeches. In, in February, he was arrested um, a little bit more than uh, two weeks after the earthquake. But several uh, papers in Bombay claim that his stance towards the government in non-cooperation in disaster relief uh, was an actual reason for his arrest. 
his approval um sorry uh, his approval of uh, of any kind of uh, cooperation with the colonial uh, government um, appeared as very unlikely, because also you could see his um, publications, those that he actually were arrested for, was very um, aggressively anti any cooperation with the government. This was very much contrary to Prasad, who made no exception to make it to made an exception for cooperation in relief work. Um, in an intercepted telegram, Nero encouraged relief organizations to cooperate with everybody except the government. So, contrary to Prasad, then he took a political stance in relief work by calling for a suspension of taxes and rents based on the damages uh, for the rural population. In the particular political context, cooperation in disaster relief meant that the Congress intended for a period of time, namely the aftermath, not to non-cooperate with the local government, which is markedly differently from just cooperating in disaster relief. Next one. The Bombay publication, the Chronicle Sentinel's special issue here, the earthquake number, which hand is yours, appealed especially to people of Western India and the metropolis. This was another relief publication for, for collecting funds. It was distributed in the metropolis, portrayed as the center for wealth and power, as opposed to Bihar's helplessness after the earthquake. For BCRC, Bombay city collected seven lakh only in the city, and then in total eight lakh in the whole of the greater uh, area of Bombay. For these collections and workers on the committee, the Congress organizational networks were really important. They often linked or overlapped with cooperating relief organizations, which provided local contexts and experiences from previous disaster operations. So not only money and resources, a number of civil society organizations, as many as 74 different organizations, uh, their leaders and committees uh, was in Mustafa Park, um, by an, approximately two weeks after the earthquake um, in the town or in the larger districts of, of Muzaffarpur. Among the first relief societies to, to arrive from the outside of the earthquake were the Marwari Relief Society, the Ramakrishna Mission, Vivekananda Mission from Calcutta. This is quite common. There were regional organizations with uh, fairly easy access to the area uh, through some roads. Appeals in regional um, and four regional, regional relief organizations of all sizes filled the newspapers in January, asking for contributions to carry out relief operations in North Bihar, Jamalpur, and Monger. The Vivekananda mission, for example, and this was quite typical for many of these organizations, they financed the first team with remains of an old relief fund and appealed for further funds um, and also medical students and so forth to help. The Hindu mission in Calcutta, the Bengal Hindu Sabha, all of them collected funds and encouraged all the Hindu Sabhas in Bengal or and Assam to send contributions to Calcutta, and then the funds were further, further distributed or taken to Bihar or bought or materials were collected. These organizations, like the Ramakrishna Mission Association from Calcutta, had established regional experience in relief work, foremost, as I mentioned before, famine relief. Um, and we can see how they also continue later than the Marwari Relief Society, the Bharat Sevak Sang and the Hindu Mahasava continued relief work in the region and significantly so in the Bengal famine, of course, of 1943-44. So it's, it's quite evident when we look at this uh, instance how previous records in relief work facilitated this participation. Um, and the local government also approved of these uh, organizations that I mentioned. They gave concessions on railway freight, for example. Um, the Marwari Relief Society and the Seva Samaj Society, together with the St. John's Ambulance and the Indian Red Cross, uh, they all made it on the list of, of government approval. But this was also then unfavorable to the many smaller organizations um, and associations that, that emerged. Um, one large, uh, other large organizations entertaining a good relationship with the government officials were the Memon Relief Society, um, the Indian Medical Association, of course, and the Sankat Transamiti under Sotish Chandra Doskukto, all of which had made prominent contributions, according to Prasad. Uh, 
the Steva Samitis and the Sanka Tran Samiti were fundamental in providing initial funding and support to the BCRC. Madan Mohan Malvia, by 18th of January 1934, had already initiated an earthquake fund. Um, um, and also used the, the local Banar Seva Samiti, both for workers as well as for funds, to pull over to the earthquake fund. Um, one of the first donations by him that would be 5,000 rupees, for example, which was quite a substantial amount. So this was also, of course, very um, well located in terms of being in Benares, which was then uh, quite close to the, the earthquake area. Um, the San Katram Samiti is very interesting if we look at uh, Calcutta. It was a relief society started by Congressman Subhas Chandra Bose for flood relief in North Bihar, Bengal, sorry, North Bengal, in September 1922 already. And it initially held um, a very similar function to the BCRC. It aimed to unify relief societies um, on a working committee in order to agree on an agenda for the relief program and prevent overlaps. Um, so with its previous experience and organizational network between relief organizations in Calcutta, it was very quick to appeal for donations, calling on students to donate money rather than spending it on Saraswati Puja and holding a meeting to organize the collection of funds which would be dispersed in collaboration with the BCRC. These initial contributions by established organizations relied very much so on local networks outside the earthquake area and helped also to portray the BCRC as a national committee. People regarded as leaders were also wanted as member of this so-called All India Committee that governed the BCRC. Um, the process of including persons of public importance was a, an, an established strategy actually um, suggested by Nero before he was jailed um, in order to establish a so-called national cooperation in order to develop into a relief organization representative of all the people of India. And thereby also is expanding its scope to incorporate a so-called idea of an, a, a, nation, a nation or a national organization. Um, as mentioned earlier, the Marwari Relief Society was among the first to establish relief center in Musafarpur, Munger and Darbanga, where a large number of the merchant community had died in the bazaars. An observer visiting the earthquake mm -hmm. area described the Marwari Relief Society as purely Indian, most likely referring to the absence of Europeans on its managing committee and among its major donors. Here, it was important, the so-called reputable Birla family and the Kolkata Corporation. They provided very liberal and generous support, according to the report. Um, and the Birla brothers from Calcutta had given 27,000 out of the 200,000 rupees collected in February, for instance. So in 1934-35, the president of the Marwari Relief Society was Braj, uh, Braj Mohan Birla, the brother of the wealthy industrious, industrialist G.D. Birla, a contemporary well-known supporter and financer of the INC uh, in the National Congress. The Marwaris were generally very sympathetic towards this political position, and since the 1920s, the leading Marwari businessman and industrialist, such as Didi Birla, Prabhu Dayal Himatsinka, and Jamna Lal Bajaj had become involved in nationalist politics. Notably, local Marwari relief organizations here, and this is quite important, the local organizations already based at in Bihar, in northern Bihar, were the organizers of these relief, and they managed the relief centers on their own accord. The main function here of the, of the Marwari Relief Society was to bring in manpower, medical students from, from Calcutta and funds. The society perhaps worked under the ideal conditions for carrying out the relief. Based in Calcutta, a metro with some affluency, which was unaffected by the earthquake, um, the society had readily available finances and access to necessary equipment and cooperation partner in local and regional Marwari associations, which may have shared similar organizational structure, as well as leading members who had important roles in cooperating relief organizations, for example, the Servants of India Society and on this committee in the BR Central Relief Committee. So it was a perfect match in a way that you have both the, the local organizations that it transferred uh, money to and which worked fairly independently in, in, in different local allocations, and but at the same time, the fundings to channel uh, fairly smoothly and with good trust. 
So if we turn to another set of publications, um, <clears throat> we can come back to it in a minute. You also see here, if we look at the, the three first slides I showed, for you, uh, showed you from, from local to national politics of relief, uh, we do have, uh, you know, images of, um, you know, if we just move quickly back to the three, yeah, yeah like urban destruction, um, a woman, the next one, the previous one again, um, also urban destruction or, you know, destruction of houses, women, um, children or youth. Um, one more back, please. And here again, a woman crying over, you know, ruined landscapes. And, and move back again, please, four, three forward, please. There you go. And here I come to the colonial uh, publications uh, where we see a lack of humans. Um, come back to this, but mainly just ruined cities and desolate landscapes. Um, the colonial government strategy to create a relief fund was set up to set up in a um, in a viceroy's fund, the viceroy's earthquake relief fund. And in the aftermath, it encouraged charitable relief and the role of so-called colonial, imperial, or state-aided relief funds as a part of its relief and rehabilitation response. Um, the government indirectly or directly controlled these funds created with the purpose of providing the main source of funding and managed to collect a large amount by relying on networks surrounding elites, the government administration and emerging institutionalized international cooperation. So this image of the, as you can see here, the great Indian earthquake did like many of the publications that were sold in support of the Viceroy's Fund rely on ruined houses and ravaged towns and infrastructure. I have written a bit about this in a, in a recent article um, on, on victimhood in the aftermath of the earthquake, uh, where we could, it, it is, creates a, a completely different idea of, of victims um, that I won't go into now, but, uh, but this is also something that I, I think is quite interesting when we look at disaster images today in the news, what they tell us about the victimhood that we, we should expect. Prior to 1934, the Viceroy had opened a relief fund after the Kangra earthquake in 1905, and again after the Quet earthquake in 1935, a fund under his patronage was founded. Tirtanka Roy, whom I mentioned before in the context of the book on natural disasters in India, he has also written three articles where he expands upon different, one is an overview article and two are quite detailed case studies. Um, he, he suggests that the history of so-called state-aided charity in the Indian subcontinent goes back to the time when the East India Company administration was socially close to prominent commercial classes of Calcutta, giving the examples of relief organized by the Governor General after the tidal wave in southeastern Bengal in 1822, so that there's a pattern already here from 1822, we can see up to 1934. So the Viceroy's fund amounted to 7 million rupees when it closed in March 1935. Almost 4.1 million rupees were contributions from the public to the Viceroy's fund, an achievement close to the estimated, of, estimated need of 4.5 million rupees provided by the Viceroy. So this was the Viceroy's then, you know, appreciation that they would need 4.5 million rupees, which was of course based on, on on, not on any you know, reality as such, but his idea of, of the need for relief. Uh, the Viceroy's Fund was from the beginning part of the government's plan for collecting charitable relief to cover, as they saw, the wide scope for private charity. This was how the state of, uh, Secretary of State phrased it. While discussing the financial plan for reconstruction, um, AAL Parsons, the Secretary to the Government of India's Finance Department, recommended public charity as the source of funds for, for reconstruction purposes. He advised to withhold a, the announcement of a contribution by the government of India towards charitable relief to the public until the private charity donations had dried up, as he framed it. So in spite of claims that the Viceroy's fund was a private fund, which was, it was uh, framed as this in the news, or in the, in, and also in these calls that was a private fund, the government of India directly worked to secure substantial contributions of, for example, 8 lakh, 800,000 rupees from the Indian People's Famine Relief Trust to the fund. So this large amount and relatively fast transfer were indicative of how the government played a decisive role in boosting the Viceroy's fund. 
Um, and this famine trust had been created by the Maharaja of Jaipur in 19, 1900, exactly, for charitable relief during famines. And soon it received uh, contributions then by wealthy nobilities, basically in the early 20th century. So the, as the grant of uh, 800,000 rupees to, to the Viceroy's Fund showed here, the local and central governments were actively involved and gave the Viceroy's Fund a very good start. Perhaps the move was a strategy to avoid um, what is well known in disaster aftermath, the prolonged wait for public subscriptions to trickle in. It's often an issue, um, as we can see. Especially in the interwar history, this was a known problem, which um, we can see in the, um, um, in the International Relief Union, for example, that was funded in order to, to counter this. The prompt transfer of a large amount from the Famine Trust in this way then helped the, VR, the Viceroy's Fund um, to have a, a very good starting plate within two weeks um, after the earthquake. At the same time, um, and this is the transfer back and forth. The uh, Viceroy's Fund was a resource for the government, strangely enough, than if it was a private fund of the Viceroy, uh, for the allocation of grants before the government's funds had been cleared. So the Viceroy's balance sheet, we can see how the, um, the coming two large reimbursements from the central and from the local government respectively for the expenditure on, for example, sugarcane harvest, the, the, planters, uh, the planters aid that was given was then first transferred from the, uh, from the Viceroy's fund and later then reimbursed uh, by government's fund. So there was a, an expedience of, of aid in this case through the Viceroy's fund. Um, and for example, also then um, the peasants, the, the landed peasants in the north, they benefited um, by getting grants for sand clearance of the agricultural land. <clears throat> so the relief budget would in the end um, cover for this, but both the central and the local government's ability to rely on this fund, um, if only temporarily, underlined that the fund served to support the relief operations by the government. So although the government claimed that the fund to be private, it was indeed not. Uh, it bore large expenses until the government had sorted out its funding and finances. So here again, an example of this, what I would call a colonial imagery of the earthquake, um, how it mainly portrayed ruins and devastated landscape. But if we look carefully, however, we can see in these desolate images, supposedly without human life, and it also maybe indicate that they are very much so made desolate for the purpose of, of taking this uh, photograph, we find people as if hiding or lurking in the ruins. There is one person sitting just behind the tree there, a little bit up, and there is, a, I think, a small boy standing slightly left to the tree in a white shirt against the wall. Um, yeah, it, it's it's quite difficult to see, but it's in the in the lower part of the image, and you can see if you look very closely, if you bring it close up. So there are quite often people peeping out in these um, images. Um, we also see um, we also see that human beings are used uh, to pose in ruins and landscapes to illustrate the enormity of damages. For instance, if there were large land cracks. Um, in the across the fields in, in North Bihar, and the, they would often then put uh, often um, other colonial officers or, or women or you know grown men in order to show uh, how how big these crevices were. So <clears throat> another fund that I want to highlight here in connection with the the Viceroy's fund was a mansion house fund in London, motivated purely by the need for a large fund collection by the government of India. And this was again, just like the Viceroy's Fund, a practice. It was the British government's preferred means for collecting emergency relief funds from the public in the 1920s and the 1930s. And indeed before that, we see it in mining disasters and different so-called natural disasters across the um, empire. We had the Titanic Relief Fund, most famously, um, that supported widows of, of those who died in, in the Titanic and families. The Mansion House Fund was, yes, I'm, I'm just one more slide. The Mansion House Fund um, was also the reason why the government of India declined uh, relief from the International Relief Union. This was 
funded by the League of Nations members for cooperation in disaster relief. The little that had been collected before the government of India intervened and stopped the collection was transferred to the Viceroy's Fund, not very su surprisingly. Um, so the 1934 earthquake and the Quetta earthquake in 1935 are here then cited as the two initial attempts to provide coordinated international disaster relief. The first was a failure, the 1934 earthquake, when, when the government declined it in favor of having its own mansion house fund, while the 1935 um, Quetta earthquake then was modestly successful. So I'll now come to my... Um, second to last slide here, um, but similar to in famine relief then, next one please. Um, I want to stress how disaster victimhood after the earthquake was a very contested ground. Uh, famines and natural disasters, so-called natural disasters, are undoubtedly have different causes and effects on society. Categories of relief after the earthquake shared many definitions with categories drawn up in famine relief. Most importantly, the classification of middle classes as a privileged category and the ability of laborers and agriculturalists and the category of so-called poor to undertake manual labor. The government had elaborated a plan for grants and loans besides this um, charitable relief, both for towns and for rural areas, but it, was, it collapsed in the end and it was distributed much more freely than, antici than anticipated. So the loss of private property was, according to the government's relief commissioner, the greatest and the most universal of the losses. Yet we don't have any data collected on the approximate numbers to sustain such a claim. The scheme of distribution here then for um, house reconstruction, and I, I take the examples here from, from Darbanga Bazar, from the Maharaja Adirajas, Kalyani Singh's foundation, if I'm, I'm not quoting it wrong, uh, where the construct, reconstruction of, of some houses in the bazaar was made. Um, so the much broader definition, for example, uh, used by the Bihar Central Relief Commission, um, com Committee and the Maha Relief Society allowed for a large number of house constructions also. And this, the, the definition of house construction um, were what, were what made up a house also expanded the distribution of, of relief. So we had in the end two very broad and diverse categories of relief receivers, the middle classes and the laboring population. Both these categories that were charted out for the relief funds experienced the disastrous consequences of the earthquake differently in terms of losses and on a time scale. Here we see um, new embankments being built in 1935 in, in North Bihar. Um, so the change of land levels would then also uh, change the flooding patterns and uh, there was a need for, for protecting settlements as well as agricultural land. Uh, so for the urban population, the destruction of houses and death had happened in an instance for the rural population, largely defined as laborers, in terms of relief categories, damages to agricultural land had a long-term effect on livelihoods. The ability to labor became the defining feature of the rural and agricultural population. In their capacity as laborers, sources referred to how they could resort to own labor as a form of relief, not only to earn, but also to repair their own dwellings or rebuild better. That is a house. Hence labor was portrayed as an asset in self-help for the poorer strata, and the domain off limits for the middle classes. Relief work as a form of aid also confirms an official view of labor as an asset to the rural population, while at the same time it contradicted the perception of financial profits made by the laborers. The government mainly employed women and children as workers whose wages were kept to a bare minimum according to its own policy. And perhaps this was also an indication that men could get better paid labor opportunities elsewhere um, on, on, on relief works or in, in the reconstruction business. The BCR, see here, um, it was not different in, in terms of the relief works. It was not uh, it, um, only the, the government's relief works we see here. So I want to just finish by saying um, these two categories of, of relief um, 
was again then what, what defined the aim for uh, the two different um, relief organizations or relief collections we saw on the Bihar Central Relief Committee, as well as the colonial government that had focused simply on the uh, distribution of relief to the middle classes in the urban settlements. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Elena, for that uh, wonderful uh, and, and large canvas uh, through which you presented this. Uh, as you know, this particular earthquake, uh, for those of us who don't do this kind of history, was largely known through the famous Gandhi Togo debate. And what Elena has done uh, is, is kind of shifted uh, uh, or, or drawn our attention to many other important uh, issues. Uh, I'm just going to flag some of the issues that I, I heard you speak about, uh, and then maybe have a question or two at the end. Uh, uh, at the very end, when you talked about this middle class and labor, and this is a question that seems to plague almost all disasters as to what is a life worth or do all humans have the same worth of life uh, which morally speaking the answer would be yes but economically translates very differently and so it's not you know so much a surprise that uh, part of the response to disasters is then to address these difficult questions as to what is a laborer's life worth what is a middle class person's life mm -hmm. worth and are they going to be dealt in the same way or differently mm -hmm. And this came up, this comes up both, both in natural disasters and man-made disasters. I know it was a big issue on uh, after 2611, for instance, on, on how much compensation was to be given to whom, et cetera. Uh, so that's a very important and significant question uh, worth thinking about in terms of how we address different strata of society uh, post uh, disasters. Uh, you also brought out very significantly the many ways in which relief organized by what you, you hear called the civil society organizations, uh, these various committees and sabhas and, and the National Congress and the way the state did it. And, and two in particular struck me uh, for the contemporary resonance. One was the sole uh, uh, attention that you paid to, to disaster images and this difference between highlighting persons uh, versus highlighting infrastructure mm -hmm. and, and what actually needs to be uh, borne in mind when looking at disasters as most disaster images, I would assume even the current uh, images that we are seeing tend mm -hmm. to be infrastructure focused rather than human focused. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's, it's something that you want to elaborate a bit mm -hmm. more on. Uh, the, uh, private funds that have government support, we are very familiar with. I will not go into the politics of that mm -hmm. at the moment. As you know, in India, it's a very lively and contested debate at the moment. Uh, but the one that struck me was uh, uh, this thing that you spoke of uh, about the Indian National Congress and the difference between Nehru and Prasad. Uh, I was curious if Nehru's stance also comes from his less than happy experience as the mayor of Allahabad. And because he, among the many Indian politicians who served as mayors, he probably resigned the earliest and was the most mm -hmm. frustrated with the British government uh, in terms of his lack of uh, support mm -hmm. to Indian actors. And whether that had anything to do with his uh, is kind of a pro, but that's a minor mm. kind of speculative mm. question. The more intriguing thing was this difference that you made that Prasad and people are not saying cooperation, they're saying not no cooperation. Mm. But that's a very subtle reading of mm. what this was about. Mm -hmm. And and again, something that, that I'd be very interested in, in hearing more on. Uh, the question that you left out to, today, you've done a bit at length in the book, but perhaps we could think more about is the information infrastructure, because this is the beginning when you say that the aircraft mm -hmm. becomes central to the information and image gathering. And the first news happens only because there are airplanes, in this case, private airplanes, 
that are able to go and land there. So it's not railways, it's not telegraph, it's the airplane. And since then, we know that this bird's eye view or the helicopter mm -hmm. view of the disaster site is part of the political vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if there's more about how information infrastructure uh, meets disaster politics, mm -hmm. Uh, again, something that, mm. that maybe perhaps we could spell out a bit mm. more. Uh, finally, uh, just an interesting observation on how a local earthquake, in the sense, say this is a Bihar, oh, oh, Bihar earthquake, then a Bihar Nepal earthquake, but also then becomes the national earthquake and the great Indian earthquake. Mm. And whether, because in the book, I think you make at least in your introductory remarks some distinction between more familiar annual disasters like floods or more regular occurring ones like famines mm. and something that is more once in a lifetime even like an earthquake of this kind mm. and whether therefore famines floods etc tend to remain local and regional mm. but with something like an earthquake you can translate something which happens in one part of the country into a national question mm. and address it as a national mm. issue and so this play between where it happens mm -hmm. and when it becomes the nation or the national, mm -hmm. again, was something that I found very fascinating mm -hmm. uh, uh, on uh, in terms of your, your comments and your reading of what was uh, happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's broadly in terms of the many areas that you highlighted, which, which uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, and you spoke. My only question is about this thing called the palliative state. Mm -hmm. So when does the care for citizens remain care? Mm -hmm. And when does it become palliative state? Mm -hmm. So, how, you know, in terms of your reading mm -hmm. of uh, this politics of care, mm -hmm. uh, what is the central element that distinguishes palliative state from, let's say, something more charitable or something more... Mm -hmm. mm, how do I call it? Something more neutral care, uh, you know? Yeah, my uh, Because that's something that people do from time to time uh, in terms of what they feel is something that's happening around mm. them that they won't attend to. So uh, that's that's the question that I wanted to flag for you if you wanted to speak a bit more about uh, the politics of care. Thank you so much for, for these very uh, thoughtful reflections and, and questions. Uh, it's, it was also, you know, um, to me, it's always interesting that almost everyone I meet in, in India would immediately flag up the Gandhi Tagore debate. Um, and when you go through the sources, both in media as well as in the government reports and you know civil society writings and literature in general, um, Gandhi Tagore debate is hardly mentioned. It, it is not very important. There's so much else on the interpretation of, of this disaster and the reporting on it. Uh, it's interesting how much that has played into the official uh, narrative uh, of the disaster and the aftermath. And I mean, I think we can only credit it to the, to the greatness of, of these um, uh, two personalities, of course, but also how it's become representative of this, you know, uh, science versus um, a more uh, spiritual approach to disaster. Um, I think it was. I was thinking about the the idea of like how, whom do we compensate and and who who is the the true victim here um, of the of the disaster who needs needs relief, and um, I, to me when we see the construction of these the in in these publications, um, it is it is a, a part of the political idea of who needs relief. It, it is not really for for a victim as such. It is mm -hmm. part of a political agenda. Um, of reconstruction, which is then again not based on actual figures of people who are suffering uh, when we look at in the government archives. Um, for example, the um, I think the the images that you also addressed in one of the com uh, in your comments here, um, the disaster images of of women and ruined landscapes, for example, from to me, I interpret that as a um, nationalization or a, a way of um, appealing to an audience to receive funds rather than to uh, portray disaster victims. Okay. Um, and the same thing here, if we look at the um, images of ruined infrastructure and desolate landscapes and so forth, 
Um, it is very much who, who is looking at these publications. They're speaking to a certain audience um, that is not empathizing perhaps with uh, at all a national framework or with a um, politics of care. Um, there is, for example, also a certain um, attempts to, to, to uh, attach to a foreign audience by uh, drawing upon World War I destruction uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. To see this, to, you know, to play on the emotional psyche of the European population, see what suffering uh, we see in India in the earthquake um, and our experiences of World War I. Um, so it's all a construction of audiences for me in these publications. I find when we look at the Nehru, um, how Nehru was extremely against any kind of cooperation with the government and that he then disappeared. Uh, I think it's 12th of February, he, he's jailed. Um, almost exactly four weeks after the earthquake, it really makes a huge difference um, to the, the way that the conversation turned away from peasants' interest in, in the aftermath in terms of relief allocations. Um, Prasad would not touch upon anything that had with the cancelling of rents, um, for example, or uh, any any kind of so-called peasant agitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, Swami Sahajanand uh, was complete. He left the whole uh, organization at this point because he was uh, so against Prasad's official uh, politics and cooperation with the government and um, what what could be seen then as a compliance with the official rhetoric to. To wait with relief also until we had, uh, for example, the monsoon was over and the reconstruction process could start in the fall, almost six months after the earthquake, a very long wait for, for relief. Um, and uh, as you said, I, I think it's also very interesting, like if they say this, that the not, uh, not to non, not to non cooperate, right, the difference here, then the cooperation uh, aspect is quite interesting that Prasad will col collaborate with governments in, in relief and the whole Bihar Central Relief Committee uh, was dedicated to it. Um, the, um, I, sorry, I didn't really get the, the question there on airplanes, but um, there was- See, that, uh, the thing about it, it was fascinating was you you thinking of this backward yeah. part of the country, which yeah. remains, continues to remain this backward part. And suddenly, you get this, your book almost opens with these airplanes mm -hmm. flying in. Mm -hmm. And you would imagine that this is a part of the world where airplanes would become the way that you can get your first news. Mm -hmm. You would think some bullock cart somewhere, some, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. some person somewhere. So it's a very striking image. Mm -hmm. And this whole infrastructure through which, you know, till you come to contemporary drones uh, is quite fascinating. What does this infrastructure have to do with how you can visualize, represent, mm -hmm. report something like uh, a disaster of this yeah. kind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And airplanes, they were really an integral part of the aftermath. They were shuttled back and forth from, from Patna to Muzaffarpur with uh, both government officials as well as uh, the telegrams, um, because the telegrams lines were down. Uh, and then from there, it would dis be distributed further by foot or bullock cart um, if the roads were good enough. Uh, so. Yes, it, it, it did something, uh, if you can say it was sort of a, another, put a completely different twist to, to the uh, idea of the disaster, as I would say also the, the urban disaster would be seen in a completely different way, very similar to, as we pointed out, we see today in the news of, of disaster images. Um, I, I think the, the earthquake, why it became like the first to say national disaster relief fund collection, because that's how the Bihar Central Relief Committee was, was framed to make a national collection, which it also really, you know, the funds were collected in Madras in, in Southern India. Um, it was collected in South Africa also, it was collected in the UK, um, especially then in, in anti-colonial networks and among Indian nationalists abroad. Um, um, and as well as, you know, whatever on the globe and in India. And the sudden disasters would, of course, be very different in terms of how we can adapt and encounter them. And also, if you see media today, um, earthquakes would be one of the most difficult um, disasters to prepare for. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, that is also, it, it's something sudden and it is something no one can 
or is at least in the public discourse or in the general media discourse, it's nothing we can know beforehand, right? Um, but there are, for example, a lot of publications on uh, it's not earthquakes that kill people, it's constructions. Uh, Roger Bilham, the uh, uh, historical disaster, uh, historical seismologist has published um, an article which is called um, Buildings as Weapons of Mass Destruction, um, for example, which is quite telling. Um, so this is really where the, um, you know, the long term um, investment in infrastructure and urban planning uh, is extremely important. Um, and it's also then interesting if we look at the reconstruction phase, I think that there was no plan to rebuild according to earthquake safe measures in Bihar after the earthquake, simply because the lack of private funding for this, right? So there was no infrastructure in Bihar uh, from the government side to implement a, a, a earthquake safe planning. Instead, we have these uh, town improvements. So there was a, a, an idea of town planning in the aftermath, but they followed, yes, there was a widening of roads, for example, some open spaces, but this was also compromised in order to increase the plots, right, to, to have as many people as possible. And they followed the kind of classic town planning we have seen in the 1920s, um, the same town planner who did Yamshed for poor, for example, uh, Tatanagar, um, the same town planner did the North, and, uh, you know, North Bihar uh, town plans. And all, all of them were implemented in the end. However, if we look then to Quetta 1935, suddenly we see that there is uh, you know, earthquake safe planning in the town infrastructure. And that we know also that Quetta was a garrison town. So it was extremely different right, um, in terms of need for planning and for mobility of, of uh, the British resources, the, the army. Right? While you see the, the North uh, Bihar towns, um, the need there was basically to open the bazaars for trade again. Uh, that was the main idea for reconstruction. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, the last point here with the, the your, actually your, the, the, your main questions as far as I understand it, um, the, uh, the idea of um, the palliative imperialism as opposed to then some sort of a, a governance of, of care, um, is, it was taken from uh, Upamanyu Pablo Singh, um, Mukherjee's uh, book. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this idea of the, um, the, the, whole, um, in, the whole colony, so the whole empire is, um, or the colonial lands is some kind of a uh, disaster zone then that needs to be rescued and saved. Um, I, I'm not sure that I subscribe to it all, all the time, but I think it's a very interesting idea of, of seeing it. Um, and I think the the idea of care here, or you know, charitable relief on a more uh, broader terms, is is really you know um, a governance that is um, integrated and uh, provides uh, basic fundamental. Yeah, yeah I find yeah. the term very intriguing. I, I picked it up from there also, and and because he doesn't. He doesn't necessarily call it bad faith. Mm -hmm. It comes, you know, it's in that version of things yeah. that it's a state acting to take care of something, but it's not actually being done in the interest of the people no. in whose name it is mm -hmm. taking care. So there is something very interesting about mm -hmm. the term, and I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to think more with yeah. in terms of how to think about uh, imperial politics, mm -hmm. which sometimes takes this form of of caring for the people mm. rather than simply extracting from them so so yeah yeah i found the term very interesting mm. and intriguing mm. yeah questions do some guy okay thank you very much uh, i just uh, wanted uh, just just a couple of things this thing about uh, the local and the national, and with nationalist mm. politics, it's it's quite understandable. Uh, but from the point of view of the colonial state, what is it that makes it national? Is it the fact that there are relief efforts uh, at the kind of you know uh, all India level or you know beyond the local area of uh, disaster? Mm. I say this because uh, when you, I mean. I have seen famine related stuff in the 19th century. Uh, as early as the 1830s, when North India has a very, very uh, severe mm -hmm. famine, uh, 
there is criticism and this we are familiar with of what the colonial administration does here in britain for example mm. that it's it's you know there are various voices there which say that the critical voices and uh, while the efforts of the colonial government were very often to uh, demonstrate that this is a local thing mm. and this will get mm. resolved and uh sometimes the uh, criticism was that no it's 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 much more so the idea of the national not not coming from the nationalists uh -huh. but it it's there i mean i've seen mm -hmm. this word mm -hmm. being used mm -hmm. uh, that no no it's a national thing mm -hmm. uh, and therefore uh, don't kind of dilute the impact by calling it local uh -huh. so in this i just just mm -hmm. curious mm -hmm. that what what is it that for them uh is there some is there an idea of the national is it because it's something to do with their administration extending to british india and things being said uh and just quickly one mm -hmm. thing and this also uh, kind of is linked to what uh, mm -hmm. uh, dr sharan has raised various things uh i'm sure it's there in your book so i i'll probably find it but even then uh the 1880 uh, famine report the first big report uh, it talks about the duty of the state to prevent starvation debts. The word duty is used. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, as we know, simultaneously uh, with the famine codes and the relief policy, which gets systematized, the idea of the deserving and the non undeserving, mm -hmm. which was already there earlier, mm -hmm. Victorian ideals, uh, it, and, and a whole range of things, new poor law, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, it's understandable for, say, a famine-like situation where you offer work uh, and people have to be employed on subsistence wages. And But the fear of government charity being misused is always there. I was just wondering that in a situation like this, is there a notion of uh, that it's, it, it's, it's our duty because it's, it, it's the state's responsibility? which is there for famine, it, 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 is, it does get talked about. Uh, but how do you, uh, is, are there undeserving people? He raised this thing about middle class. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about undeserving people uh, in a situation of uh, a disaster like this? And uh, how, how do you uh, go about it? How do you weed out people uh, by saying that, look, I mean, uh, you are disturbing the labor market by working on the famine relief work mm. and therefore go back, you know, healthy enough, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a disaster of another order. So, mm. Mm. Just to clarify, subject, the, 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 what I found interesting is, you know, the deserving and undeserving is a familiar binary. It's the differently deserving which makes it more interesting because at one level, if you see the images, all houses have been kind of flattened. Mm. Now, if I had a mud house, if I had a pakka house, uh, would I be compensated differently? Mm. So it's not as if one is deserving, the other is not, but are there people who are differently deserving and mm. how do you determine those things? That's the famine thing as well. Mm. There are it's mm. descriptions of, yeah. say, people who uh, cannot work. There is an idea of gratuitous relief. There's an idea of helping Pardanashi women uh, some of it is there as mm. well, but you're right. I mean, it's it's how you mm. everyone is flattened. So yes. Okay. And what we'll do is, do you mind if we take collect a few questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. One. You want to ask? Yeah. You want to ask? Okay. You want to ask? Okay. We'll come back. We'll come back. Yeah. yeah this misuse. Uh, let me start with this misuse of uh, charity is quite serious. We uh, as students went there in the same area after an earthquake in 89. And uh, so we had you know, some contact with a collector who gave us a cheap and we were basically surveying and then giving a kind of slip to the deserving, uh, what we thought were deserving people and they needed to more, they had more claims, you know, better uh, claims on uh, plastic, that the government was offering or whatever little relief that we were carrying, et cetera. There's always, there's always a case that, uh, you know, if you, even as a party, relief party, if you eat at the places of those who are rich, right? It's likely that they would extract something 
out of you. So that that was a danger that we saw on the ground. And you can actually, uh, you know, decide who's more deserving. Depends who's more poor. Depends whose house. It's not a question of everybody's houses getting, you know, uh, flattened. It's a question of whose house is poorly built already, you know. And that will, would decide because if you have a better house and uh, you, that means you have a bank balance also somewhere, right? Which may not be the case with a uh, mud houses only. So, so, okay. Uh, no, I mean, this is by way of information. Uh, I mean, uh, Bombay film industry uh, was very much involved in uh, raising money for the earthquake victims of uh, Bihar. Uh, Bihar. Uh, I saw looking at the film magazines of 1934, and there was also some talk of a film being made uh, uh, on, on, on this earthquake. But there was a lot of money collected, that much uh, I can tell you, uh, because this, this is almost the beginning of, you know, cinema people, celebrity, uh, you know, a uh, uh, celebrity kind of uh, philanthropy uh, that uh, I could... Uh, 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 I could uh, collect. Uh, so, but I don't uh, uh, see any uh, mention of that. So, what happened to that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I haven't yet read the book, so forgive me if uh, some of it is al already there in the book. So uh, one curiosity, is there any scientific uh, techno technological discourse that is on around this question, both from colonial experts, but also from uh, the nationalist side? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I understand the politics of it, and I understand that's the focus of your book. Mm -hmm. But just curious to know whether there is some politics of science also that is being played out. I just wanted to know that. Um, the second uh, uh, thought was uh, about uh, while I understand the distinction between two kinds of relief organizations, mm -hmm. a colonial and a nationalist one, it also seems interesting to think about what emerges from the early 20th century, in fact, from the 1920s, mm. uh, within nationalist politics as the volunteer movement. And the Congress sets up its own uh, national volunteer corps, uh, Rashtriya Swayam Seva Sangh, mm. not this one, uh, the other one, uh, the Congress one, ha, Congress. Uh, yeah. And the idea of volunteering was in fact, interestingly hybrid. You may be asked to do underground political work with arms. Mm -hmm. You might be asked to do non-cooperation, civil disobedience, kind of overground political work. You will also be asked to do uh, anything from first aid to running large uh, public uh, kitchens to disaster relief. So, thinking about this figure of a person who can, who is a, a hybrid political figure as one who also participates in. So, uh, so I wonder whether that kind of comes through. Uh, and this is a longer story, of course, Ramakrishna Mission's mm -hmm. uh, own mandate is precisely of this kind of volunteering of uh, both everyday care of the poor, but also uh, disaster relief in uh, uh, in the nineteenth century. So, just wanted your thoughts on that. And the, to come, I wanted to come back to the palliative because mm -hmm. it, it's it's exactly the crux of the argument uh, or the crux of the formulation that you're offering us. It strikes. I mean, it's interesting to make the distinction between what we understand as the welfare state mm -hmm. and what we then thematize in terms of care versus palliative uh, mm -hmm. state. Welfare state, the standard imagination of welfare state is tied to the idea of the laboring citizen, the, wor the worker citizen, who in the absence of work, 
or in context of physical injury in work or such exceptional cases such as being a single mother uh, who's not who doesn't fit the the figure of the working class man uh, the family breadwinner the so welfare state gets imagined around that figure mm. a figure who sustains himself uh except in exceptional conditions of retirement or unemployment or injury and so on and so forth and th that's one trajectory of imagining the state citizen relationship the other trajectory is the one that you are uh, discussing here which is of care and in which uh, the deserving non deserving question does not quite play out it is in theoretically a universalistic Mm. Uh, approach um and very much gendered differently um mm. it also strikes me that both the term care and the term palliative palliation are at the end of the day medical terms right and there might be something there to think about and we know that in medical terms i mean crisis is also originally a medical term though it gets a kind of overwritten to time but medically speaking palliative care is a kind of care that is given with no promise of amelioration or relief it's generally it's for dying patients right it's to make the end painless so i wonder how this concept get plays out vis-a-vis -vis relief mm. which is exactly mm. the opposite yeah. of what palliative yeah. care is meant to do so okay thank you thank i think you. Uh, yeah, yeah i think there's a, there's a lot of uh, so many thoughtful and very informed uh, questions and i will start with professor sanjay sharma's uh, questions then uh, what makes this into an, a national disaster from, from the government's perspective, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure they are considering it a, a national disaster at all. Um, surely not. It is, the whole framing is of, uh, is rather on, um, you know, the, the funds, how we can turn, turn uh, charitable relief from the public uh, towards a disaster which is copied from other disasters that we have seen and you know replicated as a similar relief answer um how to they, this is again it's not about making it into a national disaster it's about making it into the biggest the worst disaster the worst earthquake that had ever happened in india so the idea that it is an indian earthquake or the indian earthquake or the great indian earthquake um, it is, has nothing to do with the, the nation to do from the government's perspective, as I see it, is, is simply replicating, uh, you know, the greatness of the Kanto, the 1923 Kanto earthquake in this case. Well, of course, the idea of uh, national in the Bihar Central Relief Committee's uh, language uh, was an idea to to um, collect relief and to collect workers and to unite people, etc. Right, uh, but it also had an actual um, spread in terms of uh, relief collections, as I just said, and, and people coming and participating in the relief work, uh, which was, of course, also a great worry to the local administration, this influx of, of people from the outside suddenly, um, and participating in the governance infrastructure that the Bihar Central Relief Committee set up, because they had, as I said, a parallel governance, a government structure, offices and so forth, set up printing press. Um, the question of undeserving and, and deserving, uh, and I, I found that really, you know, surprising in a way that the categories of relief receivers are so uh, similar to what we see in the famine literature um, of middle classes and how they are constructed as, and they, they also the middle classes advocate very <laughs> forcefully for their relief, if we look at the uh, the, the uh, what you call it, the Bihar and Orissa um, um, proceedings, for example, the on, on, on the local levels, right? And, and all printed, at least, you know, uh, government discussions also, like the, the groups that are deserving of aid. Um, and it's, it's for reconstructing those who have owned houses that are made of brick, right? 
uh, and they should have preferably then have had solid um, cement concrete bindings within between them because this is also a major difference right in, in terms of how you build the houses not just with bricks but how they are attached to each other so and that's also in my perception where you see the government is closing in and making that relief category as small as possible in order to not having to distribute too much relief while the Bihar Central Relief Committee opens up the definition for houses to a much broader spectrum, thereby making their middle classes much, much broader, right? Including this mixed constructions that we see then in the houses that have fallen. Um, and then again, for example, which I think is also again a way of the government to evade relief to the middle classes in the countryside would be that first they say houses, uh, houses built in the, in the rural areas uh, are eligible for relief, then they withdraw that because there is no house market in rural Bihar, they claim. There's only in the urban uh, areas that there is a real you know, market value of the houses. So uh, th this is like a real differentiation between catering, catering to urban middle classes. And of course, it's also interesting because as I mentioned in the book, the franchise committee then uh, will increase the number of voters in Bihar afterwards based on having a house. Mm -hmm. So in this case, also, we can wonder what is the, the politics then of building houses in terms of, and, and this is not an, an argument that it is bribes, but it's a way, it's a very constructive way of creating a broader electorate. Yeah, that is also maybe then sympathetic to you as a government. So that would be my um, impression. And, but again, in the reconstruction phase, it's very also evident, and this I think is interesting for the laborers, they have their bodies. The government come back to this continuously, and it's also not so pronounced in the in the nationalist um, the relief organizations publications. Uh, but they are supposed to contribute with their bodies in the reconstruction phase. They are they are co contributing with labor, right? They're given materials, but they are not given funds. So this, I think, is also, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very much, you know, continuation of, of the relief uh, in famines that the, the able-bodied, uh, so to say, laborer can be there. Of course, then this is different to skilled laborers in Jamshedpur, for example. They are given relief. Um, for example, also people who have owned houses and uh, rented it. They, even they are getting relief because they are losing rents. And that's an eligible way. They get even more relief for that, right? So property really becomes the way of being deserving of relief in this process. Uh, and especially, of course, planters then, the ones who lost their crops are the deserving here, right? Because they lose uh, property. So uh, it's not at all to rebuild better for certain groups or so um, in, the, in the official, you know, it, it is a, a, about creating um, the group of the middle classes to circumscribe that um, if you look at the, the sources, at least. Um, so when, which one was the, the next so the questions? Film. Yeah, the film. I think that was really interesting. And um, <laughs> what is also, you know, there were lots, I mentioned this in the book, there are several movies, and this is again a way of collecting funds. Um, a spectacle you could go and look uh, on people who walk through these ruined cities simply filming the, the spectacle of the disaster um, and the uh, the viceroy is in one of these films also and he he's writing very contentedly that I'm, I'm becoming a hollywood star a movie star <laughs> for the first time i'm in a movie you know myself and these would then again be shown at these kind of high society events uh, across the uk uh, but also in India, uh, but also the public, of course, could pay and see these in, in public cinemas. So they were, it, it was really also a new, a new way of showing the disaster that is very similar to what Dr. Sharon said in terms of the viewing the spectacle from above um, with, the, with the imagery. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to take another shot at, at but... <laughs> the, the palliative state? The palliative state. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I, I have much more to say in terms of the, the imperialism. Um, I'm, I'm not, could you please repeat again just the, the core question there? I, I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Mm. We'll definitely invite Pabam Gharji to come and yeah. talk about the palliative state. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so why don't we just move on? Uh,
there are some people. Now we do know that this is a Bihar Nepal earthquake. <laughs> so I'm very happy that my friend Malika teaches great scholar from Nepal, teaches at South Asia University. Uh, so why don't we have Malika first at Prabhat Roshaka? You want to ask something? And there's one question from the audience, which is, did this affect the 1937 elections at all? Mm -hmm. That's great. But Malika, yeah. Thanks for giving me the space, um, Dipu. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about the nation state question uh, when you raised this that, you know, mm -hmm. the moment something is paired as Bihar Nepal, usually the Nepali response would be, why Bihar Nepal? It should be Madesh Nepal, or it should be <laughs> Nepal India. There should be. Uh, and I was thinking that this is one occasion where it absolutely makes sense to call mm -hmm. it Bihar Nepal because mm -hmm. that's exactly what the earthquake was, right? Because it affected quite a lot of territories in Nepal, whereas in the other side of the border, it's kind of Bihar. Um, I'm kind of, you know, but again, I mean, in Nepal, there is a great discourse about the great Nepali earthquake. And many people in Nepal actually don't know that Bihar was so fundamentally affected by this. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, I was, there's really so much to take from your lecture um, and your book is on my reading list. So now I think I'll, I'll, I'll understand it much better when I go back and read it. Um, but I'm looking at it from the context of the recent 2015 earthquake that was only Nepal earthquake, it wasn't that much of a Bihar earthquake. Um, and then kind of the research work, I've been working on the Bihar-Nepal border, but more on the Nepal side since 2009 and 10. And it's only now in the aftermath of the coronavirus pandemic that we've begun our research work on the Bihar side of the border as well, right? So these two crises that are kind of you know, really uh, in my mind when I think about this. I wanted to ask about this question of, memory because you know what is very clear uh in case of the inquiry about coronavirus recently is that there are two categories of people people for whom they lost many family members they were stuck on the other side of the border in the quarantine in a border that usually is never shut but this was the only time when it really got shut right i mean so these are people who really went through it in a personalized sort of way and they have a very different and hurt narrative of the coronavirus versus others who kind of I was thinking about Deepu's kind of you know, notion of a uh, bird view kind of you know experience, a bird view view that even for people who are from the same region, you know, who were in the lockdown, staying in social isolation, mm -hmm. I think for them the narrative about the pandemic, even in their own local town, is mm -hmm. similar. That is so distant. The only thing that they actually see and have seen or heard, you know, was what was there in the TV or radio, you know, it's almost like being a seven ocean apart, right? Which is not the case for the earthquakes because the ground shook and it affected everybody that was there. But, um, you know, in 2015, very interesting discourse that emerged among the anthropologists. And as an anthropologist, I find it fascinating to hear about the details of historical mm -hmm. records, uh, was the people who were right in Nepal when the earthquake hit and who shook with the ground, they seem to have a kind of narrative, which is kind of not quite, the same for people who are not there. I was not there for the first earthquake. I mean, I was there for the second. Uh, but, you know, among the anthropologists, there was, uh, just to kind of clarify my, but I don't want to go uh, into details, but, you know, uh, I mean, th so the expressions of hurt was so much more exaggerated for people who actually weren't there because they imagine, I think it's coming from empathy, but it's also the research language, right? But what was clear was that is several competing narratives. And we know about these competing narratives only because it's so recent, you know, we were all there. We've read in vernaculars, in social media, through consultations, but what would happen after a hundred years? And, you know, is it possible to mm -hmm. dig for those competing narratives or competing memory mm -hmm. to archives? Um, and, you know, what was your kind of gut feeling as a historian digging through these, you know, when uh, kind of a you know, national kind of relief institution was set up, the relief fund was set up, which is very similar in mm -hmm. Nepal, mm -hmm. except I think thanks to 2015 earthquake, people are aware that although there is this prime minister's relief fund, you know, that's a very small part of the picture. Mm -hmm. There have been so many other things that have gone on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of my questions, which I thought I will ask, have been articulated well by my uh, colleagues in the form of question or observation so uh, and we don't have enough time left so i'll uh, stick to uh, one or two 
uh, it's not actually a question. Uh, I was wondering, I have also not read fully your book. I have read until three chapters. So. <laughs> uh, is there any uh, thing in the book? Huh? So when, uh, what is the, in your, in your reading, the notion of politics, uh, in fact, politics of relief in relation to uh, the promotion of folk art, huh? Madhubani, uh, which you were thinking of uh, uh, writing. If it is <laughs> there in the book, uh, that uh, the folk art, Madhubani art, uh, during, uh, in the aftermath of earthquake. Is there anything in the book uh, on this? Yeah. If it is, if, uh, you, you would like to speak about it. Uh, and the more substantive uh, thing, the clarification that I uh, wanted, in fact, it is there in the book and you mentioned in passing, uh, this competing uh, competitor, the International Congress emerging as the competitor mm. of the colonial state. Mm. Yeah, so in terms of governance, potentially we are able to take charge and we can show this to you. And hence you have also this charges by level by the colonial government that mm. of corruption. Mm. So in, in a case, in a sense, it's also of inefficiency that you are not efficient enough mm. to uh, perform such tasks and so forth. So uh, was this kind of institutional allegation or is it about the private individual's corruption that they are talking about? If you could clarify, because uh, within the nationalist groups, there has already been talk of corruption in the Harijan Sevak Sangh uh, uh, misappropriation of fund by the congressmen, mm. a certain mm. congressmen. So, uh, uh, and uh, this is happening in uh, 1934, yeah. uh, around the same time uh, that uh, we could see. Uh, also, uh, the this, this second thing, uh, the clarification, of, uh, is it so? Do you see internal fractures within this uh, Congress or the competitor of colonial uh, regime or govern governance in waiting? Huh? Mm -hmm. The Congress as uh, it em is emerging. So uh, internal fractures in a sense that on communal lines mm -hmm. in the politics of relief, on uh, other uh, say caste lines also, because uh, the I see a hint in your footnote. Mm -hmm. uh, Rahul Sankritya and when he visits, he categorically mentions that people who are associated with the Anman Prasad Poddar, the Marwaris, mm -hmm. uh, the Gita Press related mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. they are discriminating clearly with the Muslims, victims. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, sure. Three questions. One on elections. That should be fairly. That was yes. a question asked yes. by somebody from the audience. Uh -huh. Prabhat's question on, on the Congress and, and what is going on inside the Congress. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Malika's on memory. Mm -hmm. To that memory question, if you could just add, mm -hmm. you know, in as a historian, you asked the question, is this history of any use? And mm -hmm. several people tend to ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I find it very interesting that mm -hmm. to have an anthropologist poses the same. So two experiences mm. about 70, 80 years apart, mm. not a question of lesson, a question of what kinds of memories get shaped. Mm. And mm. it doesn't have to do with disciplines, uh, but mm. how we ask those questions, mm. uh, but, but certainly a very important issue to think with. Yeah, of course, yeah. No, thank you very much for those, you know, <laughs> a question from another field and from experiences with this, the recent earthquake in, in Nepal, or the recent earthquakes. Um, I mean, as an historian, bringing in competing narratives uh, is a part of the trade, so to say, that we interpretations of, of many experiences and points of view um, should be there in the sources. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, um, to, you know, to do the craft in a, in a, in a proper way. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that, and I mean, I, I I can absolutely acknowledge that there was um, very difficult to collect um, the material and sources, and I'm sure there is a lot of um, primary sources still there to explore. For example, the the great idea also to look more into the movies of that time, um, and we also looked at you know later movies that have co incorporated this earthquake in in their narratives. Um, 
So I, I, I think there is definitely more in literature to look at um, and uh, more in native um, languages. For example, the, the Urdu press um, could, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not fluent in, in reading Urdu so that I have relied on, you know, um, indexes and indices and so forth while I've gone through a lot of newspapers printed in English and in Hindi um, foremost. Um, so there, you know, the, this again is a source problem, of course, and I, I would say that um, I've been to archives uh, in Switzerland of private collections that of people who were in Bihar at that time, and through those collections I have got government records uh, or Relief Society reports that are nowhere else to find. Um, so there is also this, you know, twist of where you find the local source. Yeah. And someone has carried it all the way to to Switzerland. The most, you know, village resettlements uh, in the northern, most northern parts of Bihar, uh, has somehow been worth saving in these archives. Um, but there's nowhere to find in British Library or in, in India. Um, and the same with like even a publication by Rajendra Prasad, who I found nowhere else, an, an archive in Switzerland in a private collection. Again, so it's, it's really erratic in terms of finding these multiple narratives and how to preserve these memories. Uh, but I mean, the earthquake still um, exists in public memory as this kind of a divider. Your great grandmother or grandfather was born before, after the earthquake and so forth. There was even this, I, I saw like a puja for the, for the victims of the earthquakes a few years back, right? Commemorating the, the victims. So, uh, it's still memorized in, in different ways. And you can see also in the house for sales, if you walk down the, the biggest st streets in Patna, uh, built 1934, 1935, you know, it's all like, it's it's a very important year still there inscribed in public memory. But I do not think it's the same way as in Kathmandu, for example, where you have all these memorials of the earthquake. In, in, in my knowledge, it is not there, you know? Um, you know, you have these monuments that lasted, they become in a way representative of 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 the earthquake that by them standing still there while many were ruined and then the new ones become representatives like a time divider again yeah and there's so much interesting research um, i would really recommend also yogesh raj's publications on the uh, nepal earthquake he has done great work in the archives and working with a lot with you know really documenting what are there in terms of sources on the earthquake we actually had yogesh speak to us about that Oh, really? Uh, I don't uh, yeah. yeah. Still, Pravats, yeah. Pravats, Pravats, yeah. Uh, on oh, yeah, sorry. All that they uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the, in terms of uh, com uh, corruption, um, surely so there was corruption there. There were constantly these allegations uh, against um, different relief organizations of communalism in, in relief. Um, and there were also certain relief societies that would cater only to, to a certain community, uh, Bihar Central Relief Committee would even, you know, divide its uh, relief according to cost or certain interest groups, right? Um, which is interesting also because there are also these religiously founded organizations that have absolutely no um, categories in terms of relief except for middle class and laborers, right? Um, and again, then this house to house distribution of relief for certain categories while others had to, you know, pick it up in public and so forth so um there were this like two three years after the earthquake it came back again these allegations of relief uh being embezzled for other purposes and it was both putting it in the pockets of congress workers but also using it for political ends right so these are two different forms of, of corruption within this the bigger relief network um and then again it was not really you know didn't really come to to any solution, so to say. Uh, the government really pressed the Bihar Central Relief uh, Committee very hard uh, to put all their remaining funds into middle-class relief in order to make them, you know, give away with the funds not to use them for anything else. And this was in 1936 and 1937. Uh, this discussion came up again that at, you know, uh, in 1935, they wanted them to give away the funds, but the Bihar Central Relief Committee refused to do so. Do so. What was the question? I didn't see it on the but, chat down about the yeah, 1937. Whether basically, whether the, the 1934 earthquake and the relief operations, did it have any bearing on the 1937 provincial elections? Um, yeah, I would, I, I suggest so, but there might also be people who have worked more on the elections. Um, but I can, you know, there's, 
definitely a link there between um, how you expand the house base or at least try to expand the house base, which I think is linked to what well, they already knew that in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, commission reports in 1934, that they wanted to expand the, uh, the franchise, yeah, the electorate in that region. And it was one of the lowest, I think it was if not the lowest, the second lowest in the whole of India, and it needed to increase. So, yeah. yeah. On that it. note, yeah. thank you very much uh, sure. for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I can only add, you know, those absence of monuments and stories. It is, uh, for me, the earthquake was, was a family, part of the family law for the simple reason that my father would say that he was born Jisal Bukham Payatha. Mm -hmm. yeah. And since it happened in January, he conveniently chose whatever month he wanted to choose for his actual date of birth. But mm -hmm. there is a way in which it does become a marker mm -hmm. of the before and after mm -hmm. uh, in many ordinary ways that it circulates. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much. Thank you for having and me. And wonderful to have you over. Thank you for all the questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.